great. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to this February SPDA meeting. Yeah, and uh, you know, with further ado, today's talk is 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 uh, shaping up to be really exciting too. Uh, it's azimuth exploration. Uh, so Simon uh, Ule, uh, he's gonna he's the chief geologist of the company. Uh, so he's gonna talk about their the Elmer, Elmer discovery which was actually, uh, uh, I think last year was uh, one of the finalists for the Quebec's uh, uh, discovery of the year by the AEMQ, uh, the Mineral Exploration uh, Association in Quebec. So it's an excellent you know, discovery and, and like he'll, he'll talk about it, it's pretty typical you know, grassroots discovery story and, and they've had really good success continuing to drill it off. And Simone joined the company just over a year ago, I think a year and a half ago. And before that, he was with Beric uh, for 13 years. So we just chatted about it. He's, he's worked basically all over the Americas and Nevada and uh, Chile uh, with Beric on, on different gold deposits. And uh, yeah, so now he's bringing his expertise to, to the ASM team. So yeah, with further ado, thanks Simone for joining us. So I'm going to stop the screen share and you can go ahead and and share your presentation. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, coming and giving us this talk. Thank you, Attila. Uh, do you guys see my screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen and you can feel free to put your video on. Okay, uh, perfect. I turned it off because you said uh, to preserve some people's bandwidth. Oh, it's, yeah, that's that's the others, but you're you're the speaker, so oh, okay, good. <laughs> 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 well, I want to thank thank you, Attila, and thank thank the SPDA for the opportunity to uh, discuss. Uh, and uh, yeah, just to uh, clarification, Attila, like it, it's been finalist, I think, for the discovery of the year at Explore two years in a row. So maybe next oh, year will be the lucky there one. You go. Who knows? Three is the, three is the <laughs> <term>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of one three. So, uh, so the uh, basically here, I just wanted to put every everybody on the team. Uh, they all, everybody participated in, uh, in in this presentation, which I kind of gave a version of, of this at Explore. Uh, of course, Jean-Marc Lulin, which is the president and CEO of the company. Um, uh, François Bissonnette, which is. Uh, Basically, chief of operation Michel Chapdelaine, who just recently joined joined our team, Sandro Bourassa, senior exploration geologist, uh, Rémi Delporte, which is um, uh, a very young and talented young geologist, and I forgot Léa Radouin, who just uh, joined us uh, as well uh, a month ago. Um, so, if we look, um, I have to press here. Whoops. Okay, it's just slow. Just a uh, location of the property. It's uh, highlighted here in yellow. Uh, this is the Elmer property. All the other properties in gray are uh, other um, land holdings of, of uh, Azimuth. So the Elmer property as it stands today is basically 35 uh, kilometers by 10 kilometers. It's located about 800 kilometers north of uh, Montreal. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, the, the Billy Diamond Highway, which was formerly called the, the James Bay Road. Uh, we, we go up to kilometer about 418, uh, and that's where we, we basically fly to the property. Uh, and, and we can, during the winter, we can also access the property by uh, ski and, um, and the winter equipment. The Patouin zone itself, it's about 26 kilometers in, inside the property. And as we were discussing before, uh, before the official start of the talk, uh, Azimut became interested in this area because of their uh, uh, regional targeting expertise, and especially in the James Bay, uh, where they were interested in the in this area uh, for a very long time because of their regional targeting uh, using their proprietary Aztec min um, methodology, and they had staked a, a little claim uh, which was called Duxbury, if I'm not mistaken, the first property which was basically the Eastern part of, of the Elmer property at its stand, but Patron is in the Western part. And uh, so they already had Duxbury and in 2018, uh, the claim became available, which, uh, which was, uh, I think, I think Jean-Marc couldn't believe his luck. He, he was uh, able to stake the property as well, which he had wanted for a long time. 
and basically that became the, the complete Elmer property as it stands today. Um, if we take a look a little bit at uh, the geological context, um, we're within the superior craton, of course. Uh, the, the patrol property outlined in black here, uh, the, the Elmer property outlined in black uh, here, where we have the red star sh basically showing where the patrol zone is. Uh, it, it's basically a, a like east northeast Schwending uh, belt of su supracrustal and gabbroic rock. Uh, it's dated at about 2745 to 2752. Uh, there is uh, a green schist species metamorphic window uh, within that belt, uh, and Patouin is basically within uh, that window. The uh, property and, and the Patouin itself is about 10 kilometers north of the uh, bound, boundary between the sub province, uh, the Lagrange sub province, and the Nemisco sub province. The Nemisco sub province is basically the same as the Opinaca sub province. Um, and it's a very similar uh, setting as the Elonor gold mine, which is uh, basically in the Opinaca sub province, but very close to that boundary. Um, the other projects in the area, we have the Clearwater project, which uh, most people know uh, it's Fury gold mines, been around for, for a very long time. And active recently, there's the James Bay lithium, which is basically right next to the kilometer 381. Uh, it's a it's a lithium rich a spodumene rich pegmatite which has been found because of a forest fire basically and uh, it's in active development uh, at this point um, so next we'll look basically like um, what has been done recently on uh, on the Elmer property uh, it's basically has been a twofold uh, approach since the discovery of Patois. Uh, it has been advanced in order to uh, prepare it for maiden resources, uh, which as Imut uh, hoped to release in, in late 2022. Uh, and um, also basically continue the exploration of the greater property because we believe that there is a, a very, very high probability that the Patois zone is not by itself, but that we will find other zones similar to this one. So uh, in 2021, we completed 10,000 meters of, of drilling, basically drilling on a 50 meter grid up to a depth of about uh, 450 meters. Uh, we also started metallurgical testing, uh, density measurement, section work, 3D modeling, uh, everything to prepare the, uh, the zone for a maiden resource. We also did about 1,200 meters of exploration drilling just around the Patron zone, which um, which old 88, which was announced a few months back, was one of these old. Um, on the greater property, uh, the work uh, included an interpretation of the lithostructural architecture based on magnetic data, um, satellite imagery, all the public data, and also our own prospecting data. Uh, which we built with multiple uh, campaign of prospecting uh, on the property. We also have a till survey, uh, induced polarization survey, and uh, about 3,900 meters of, of drilling that was done last year. Um, so if we look at the evolution of Patois, um, as I discussed, it was first drilled in uh, late 2019 with seven drill holes for, for a total of like uh, less than a thousand meters, and all those drill holes hit mineralization. Then in 2020, uh, 34 drill holes added about 7,400 7, meters to the zone and basically outlined the zone, which, which reached uh, about, um, about 500 meters of strike length and uh, a depth of uh, about 250 meters. Then at the end of the 2020 program, once we had received all the results, this is the, the zone as it uh, stands uh, right now. So we're talking about a zone that's 520 meters of strike length and, and goes all the way down to 450 meters. And it's obviously open, wide open at depth. There is a, a central core of, uh, of uh, thicker and, and, uh, and it's mainly thicker mineralization with 
but sometimes a bit more great as well. But and and then we'll see later uh, geologically what this relates to. So this section is uh, is a longitudinal section. It's basically oriented with demineralization. So it's not like a, a vertical section. It's it's dipping about seventy five degrees towards the uh, the north north uh, west. So it's north two fifty six seventy five. So like the best intercept that have been drilled so far uh, include all uh, 86, which is a 24 grams per ton over 18 meters. Some of the long intercept uh, of the first uh, campaign in, in 2019, uh, three grams per ton over 90 meters, that was all the 34 and 6.43 grams per ton over 40 meters. That was all, um, that was all 72. So, like I said, the property was basically staked by Azimuth in 2018 when it was dropped uh, by the previous uh, operator. Um, <clears throat> quickly after that, I think in, in I think it was in, in 2019, um, Jean Marc and Francois went to see uh, basically um, what what they had just acquired. And, and this is basically the uh, patois um, stripping as it stands today. Uh, basically, when they arrived, this vein here that we see, uh, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, this, this vein, this one was outcropping. It was the main outcropping vein that had been discovered before uh, and sample. It was in uh, an assessment report and it graded up to 10 grams per ton, I believe. But Apart from a, a little bit of that vein and, and, and a bit more veins around here, most of this was not cropping. So they started basically removing the moss, uh, taking some samples. And, and one of those samples that they took like uh, right along the main shear, uh, which is here, is basically in the alteration salvage of, of the main shear returned uh, 54 gram per ton. So they quickly did some trenches and you can see here, um, all the trench results uh, that they got. After this became very clear, it uh, needed to be drilled. So they, they got some drill and, and drilled it in 2019 with the result that we've all already discussed. If we, uh, next slide will basically be the same view, but we'll remove the goal value and look at the geology. So here uh, is basically the outline that, that in, in black is basically the, the area of, uh, that was uh, stripped mechanically. Uh, and you, in red, of course, uh, is basically a mapping of like the outcropping vein. And blue, you can see uh, the main shear zone going through, um, going through the uh, outcropping area. And, and the different color represent the, 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 <clears throat> the geology in pink you see the, um, it's basically a felsic to intermediate intrusive, which is basically a plug and uh, plug seal and dike complex, uh, cutting um, uh, a, a volcanic package in, in yellow, you get the felsic volcanic rocks and in green, um, they're, they're mafic rocks, could be basalt, could be uh, some volcanic intrusive, they're, they're mostly fine grain. And then uh, we don't see it on, on at this scale, but further south, there's basically a, a real gabbro that um, that basically almost marks the foot wall of, of the mineralization. So the section that we saw before is basically oriented north to 256 and, and dipping to the northwest. Here you get the outline of it. So this we kind of like zoomed out. Um, so here you see all the drilling that we've done, uh, that we had done up to uh, the beginning of the current campaign. In uh, the, the red hatch pattern basically shows uh, the outline of the mineralization on surface. So it's, it's basically a projection along dip of the mineralization up to the surface. Uh, so the outcrop would be right here. Um, and uh, the rest was basically deduced mostly from drill intercept projected to surface along uh, the um, mineralized zone orientation. So, um, well, the other thing of interest is we have like a, a polygenic conglomerate, uh, which is 
which is variably deformed to the north of, uh, of the zone up to here. It's, it is kind of extending as well. It wasn't, it wasn't recognized at first, but we're, we're, we're seeing that this uh, conglomerate is much bigger than we, uh, than we first anticipated. So this is section 300. That's the section going through basically the middle of the deposit here. And we can see uh, the outline of generalization. And in pink here is basically, we're going through like the, the um, central area of the, uh, the main intrusive plug, which has um, uh, important control on the mineralization. Um, often the mineralization is either in or in close proximity to that intrusive, uh, mainly due to like the, the, the rheologic contrast between the, um, the host rock and that intrusive. So you can see some of the results we've got um, last year on, on that section, 070 and 071A, which were quite impressive intercept uh, with uh, 30 to 40 meters of four to five gram per ton, including uh, upwards of 20 grams per ton over five to uh, six meters. So it's, 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 we have wide mineralization and it always has like a, a, a very high grade component, which is uh, um, very interesting. So if we look here at some of the mineralization control, of course, one of the important thing, uh, uh, thing on that deposit is the vein orientation. On that stereo net, you can see basically um, all the, uh, the oriented veins that were measured down hole, uh, and they've been colored by basically the grade of the interval within which they were measured. So in black is the highest grade, uh, upwards of five grams per ton. Uh, you got the other legend here, and then magenta one to five grams and all that stuff. So we, we, we see we have different sets of veins. Uh, and I've put also here a small steronet showing all the uh, main foliation, the schistosity that we've measured. So we can see that we have like one set of vein, which is uh, clearly in the schistosity. And at the outcrop, um, it's the photo on top here uh, with uh, basically a shear vein uh, oriented north to 6087. Um, that's, that's going like basically through the, the, the ozone. Another set of veins that we have are basically the um, uh, north, northwest extension vein, which would be basically this group here and this group here. I'll just move to the next one, uh, which we uh, also see at the outcrop and also have gold. And uh, we also have a set of almost flat uh, they're, they're slightly dipping, but we have a set of, uh, of a sub horizontal uh, vein in the deposit. What's interesting is that all the different orientation of veins have, um, have gold associated with them. So <clears throat> we can see that the, the gold system was uh, quite long lived and, and not just associated with one of the, uh, the movement on the property. So Visible gold, there's quite a bit of visible gold associated with, um, with the deposit. It, it's quite fine grain, though it's not like huge, huge nugget, but we see it both uh, associated with pyrite or, or um, in the veins or in the vein salvages. Um, and we, we also see it sometimes by itself in the quartz or on the border of the quartz. So it kind of tells us that we, we see probably two different different phenomenon of gold deposition, uh, probably due to sulfidation being in with pyrite, but it's not in the pyrites completely, uh, completely uh, free. And we also have gold by itself, probably related to hydrostatic decompression of the fluid, depositing the gold by itself. Our main um, sulfide, and, and it's almost our only sulfide. There is a bit of galena, sometimes a bit of molybdenite, but but uh, the, the majority of the sulfide, the great, great 99.9% .9 of the sulfide or even more is pyrite. Um, but we have different types of pyrite 
uh, on the property. Um, there is uh, clearly a thin genetic pyrite, which you can see very clearly on, on the bottom uh, photo of core here. This pyrite is um, basically um, reworked by the schistosity, by the shearing. Um, and um, <clears throat> it's usually, it doesn't have much grade. Usually it shows between 200 PP, uh, PPB to maybe 600. And we also have um, uh, the epigenetic pyrite, which is often subautomorph to automorph. As we can see here, it's not been uh, deformed by the schistosity. It overprints the schistosity. Um, when we see this pyrite, we usually have uh, high grade. Here on the left, you can see a graph of basically the gold grade versus uh, the sulfur grade. You can also do it versus the, um, the pyrite log by a geologist. It gives a similar picture. It just gives a better distribution if you use the sulfur grade. And since pyrite is our um, almost our only sulfur, uh, we, can, we just can use a sulfur grade to estimate pyrite. What's interesting is that you can clearly see the two different uh, trends of the volcanogenic pyrite here and also the, the, the originic pyrite, which is the main trend going up. These have also been colored by their host rock. So you can see the felsic volcanic in yellow. Uh, the gabbro is a dark green. The light green is basalt. And then the felsic intrusive is pink. And the intermittent intrusive is orange. So you can see that the system cuts all the lithologies. And, um, <clears throat> and, um, and yep. So you might ask why, why you say that the synergetic pyrite doesn't have mineralization when this sample at the bottom here shows 28 grams per ton, um, mainly because we've had a lot of this pyrite that doesn't have the overprint of the originic uh, system. And they usually are very low grade and they're really well represented by this trend here, which is um, all in felsic volcanics. So it all makes sense. This sample, the, the gold is not associated with the 28 gram per ton, is not associated with this synergetic pyrite, it's associated with the, um, with the um, epigenetic pyrite that came uh, in the salvage of the quartz carbonate vein that you see on the right. As far as alteration, we, we have an alteration that's basically dependent on the protolith of, of the rock. Uh, we get, um, we get, of course, more uh, sericite and uh, calcite in, in the felsic rock. When we have more intermediate to mafic rock, we get more anchorite. Um, we also get like a kind of a brownish silica, which is iron titanium, probably due to the presence of leucoxine. Um, we have also sometimes tourmaline associated in the veins or, or just in, in the rock itself. Uh, often there is some visible gold associated with that term tourmaline sometimes as well. Um, and we often have also chloride uh, in the veins uh, when we're in the, uh, the high grade zones. Another alteration that we get is kind of a, a, a pinkish felspar. Um, we haven't stained it, but I believe it's actually sodic felspar based on ge geochemistry. We seem to have... Um, proximal sodic and, and distal uh, potassic alteration um, associated with the system. So some of the uh, mineralization control over here, we've talked about the intrusive before. On, on the left, you can see um, the 3D model of the intrusive as it stood um, at the end of the last drilling campaign. Uh, and you see that we have basically two main intrusive plug and uh, basically a set of, of dike and sills cutting through our, 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 our volcanic package. The, <clears throat> the view here is towards the south. There's an important rheologic contrast between the basalt and felsic uh, volcanic pile and that felsic to intermediate intrusive. And that's really well illustrated by the photo on uh, the right, where you can see the intrusive cutting through the basalts. There is some veins in the basalts, but they're, they're, the density is not very, very high. Once you, uh, when, once the, the shear zone hit the intrusive, the intrusive just explodes 
in multiple direction and you get a vein density that approaches like 25 to 30% in that intrusive. Um, so that's where you get the thickest zones of, of mineralization. Not necessarily the highest grade. Uh, the highest grade is often uh, in the basalt just close to the intrusive or in the shear zone, uh, probably due to the high iron content of the basalt. But um, I'd say that the intrusive has a very, very big importance for developing a thick zone and basalts for developing the, the I grade. Over here, uh, there's other rheologic contrasts, not just the intrusive that uh, play, have something to play, have a part to play in the deposit. As I said, we have like what we call the foot wall gabbro, it's not really the foot wall because there's a bit of mineralization in the gabbro sometimes. But here you see the zone of uh, the mineralized zone basically hanging just on top of, of that foot wall gabbro. Uh, and over here we can see um, basically uh, an example of a mineralized zone just at the contact between the gabbro and the felsic tuff, mainly in the felsic tuff, but the zone kind of um, goes in the gabbro as well. Um, and, and that zone, which uh, is not the main zone, it's just another zone in the um, at the contact of the gabbro is uh, return four grams over 18 meters. So geochemically, um, we have very, very clean uh, mineralization. It's mostly gold is our main pathfinder. Uh, like the, the element that has the, the highest concentration is, is usually gold. Of course, uh, we got silver associated with it. The ratio of gold to silver is about 10 to one. So we got 10, more, 10 times more gold than silver on average on the Patron zone. Um, of course, there's also sulfur associated with it because of the pyrite association. Um, and some of the other elements associated with it, like lead, uh, we do see some galena in trace, uh, often in quartz vein, um, and it's usually associated with, with higher silver number as well, but slightly higher. We don't have like <clears throat> super high silver number in Patron itself. Um, and then we have also tellurium. Tellurium is also um, part of the geothermal system for sure. And then we got bismuth and tungsten. I'm not convinced if bismuth and tungsten, if they are associated with the hydrothermal system or just the intrusive, uh, which was there before the hydrothermal system. So um, we can see. But using these six elements, we can also do a metal factor, which has a pretty good correlation um, with, uh, with the mineralization. Um, but like I said, if you compare like the value of uh, an PPM of gold versus these, these pathfinder gold is is higher usually than than the pathfinder that that can help us uh, looking at gold. But looking at all these elements can help us uh, focus on the zone, looking at maybe a, an alteration envelope or something like that. Talking about an envelope, this here is uh, the the Patois, uh mineralized envelope at the cutoff of 0.3 grams per ton. It's, it's again this is a view towards the um, that's an error. Uh, here is actually a view towards the, the, the south southeast. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> so we can see a continuous mineralization. Um, that's that's 520 to 580, 520 to 580 meters, goes to a depth of almost 500 meters, and then we're continuing to drill it uh, this year. The the width varies from um, 80 meters to maybe a couple of meters with, with an average. Uh, a true, an average true width of, of uh, more or less 35 meters. So here we got a little bit of, um, uh, of how we see uh, the, the, the mineral system at Patois. So basically, um, we believe there was first a, a reverse phase that basically created your shear vein and also the sub-horizontal uh, extensional vein these ones and created the shear vein. And uh, after that, there was basically a, a rotation of the main, um, 
the, the main constraint and, and it basically changed to a, a, a dextral transp transgressive phase, sorry. And, and that, that basically reactivated your shear vein and also um, created those Northwest extension veins. Um, again, when we hit the Celsic intrusion, we, we just see a, a, a very big rheologic contrast and, and, and the zone thickens around that intrusive. So as far as the greater uh, Elmer property, here we see the, um, uh, the property with uh, uh, the residual magnetic um, image. Uh, and where Patouin is basically right here, this central one, this is all the other uh, different occurrences that are known in, on the property. Um, past Explorer had focused mainly to the north here, where there's like a, a very thick sequence of um, sericite altered volcanics. And they were basically looking for maybe a, a bousquet type mineralization. Um, but not much focus was done where Patouin is. And you can clearly see on, on that mag image, um, potentially the metamorphic gradient. So you can see that where Patouin is, you can see a very high contrast mag, that pattern, and it's actually been confirmed by the field work we've done, corresponds more or less to, to the green chest facies with this kind of more diffuse mag pattern to the Northwest here, corresponding to a, a lower in um, metamorphic metamorphism. So the road ahead uh, for, uh, for Patouin and, and the greater Elmer property, uh, we'd like with, with the current exploration program uh, to extend the mineralization up to 800 meters uh, with a, basically a 50 by 50 meter grid down to 500 meters, uh, which is the first blue line here. And another, and another um, uh, grid, basically a 75 by 50 meter down to 800 meters. As far as the greater Elmer property, uh, there'll be a minimum of 6,000 meters of, of exploration drilling, as well as, as an RC program to basically test the, the covered area. <clears throat> All the exploration work that, that was done on the greater property up to this point, as kind of a, it has a bias for the outcropping or sub outcropping area. Uh, basically the IP response is, is much stronger um, on these area and the swamp seem to mask uh, our IP survey. The till also has a bias for uh, these area. Uh, and of course, the prospecting cannot see underneath the swamp. So in order to get um, a geochemical footprint on, um, on these covered area, which, which are uh, at least uh, 50, if not more in percentage of the property, we'll do some about 300 meter space uh, lines of RC drilling, just getting to bedrock uh, and, and getting a ge geochemical sampling uh, sample so we can have um, a targeting tool to um, explore these uh, covered area. So just in summary, um, we, we, are, we are in the James Bay, uh, in the new New Yorkian originic system with a strong structural control uh, with the Northeast and Southwest shear and, and with competency contrast also influencing the mineralization um, between the intrusive and the volcanics. Our mineralized zone is sub-vertical, sub uh, dipping about 75 degrees, and it's been defined uh, for a, a strike length of, of uh, 580 meters and to a depth of 450 meters with a true width averaging 35 meters. We, we believe there's a high probability of a kilometric extension uh, to the Patron zone. Uh, the metallurgical testing that we've done so far outline, outlines excellent recovery uh, 90% by standard cyanide, cyanide leaching and including uh, greater than 25% by a gravimetric circuit. Um, there's excellent potential for additional discovery on the Elmer property. And, and I think the whole team is excited uh, that we'll bring those discovery uh, to the table in the coming years. So I think that's it. Uh, just want to thank you for the attention. If there's 
any question, if somebody wants to go deeper on any of that stuff, uh, there's no problem. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks, Simone. I mean, that's, that was a really great presentation, and you guys have done an amazing amount of work in just a couple of years, just from discovery, advancing the geologic understanding. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, good future here for this this project. I had a few questions already that you already answered, but um, I get a few more, and then I see in the chat there's a couple of questions already, and I encourage everybody if you want to use the chat at the bottom to to give any questions or, uh, you know, you can also raise your hand and then we can, we can unmute you. Um, there was a question by uh, Jujana, which uh, uh, I was going to ask too about the, the base metals. And so you, you've, you've shown sort of that there's not a whole lot of other metals associated with the, with the actual gold mineralization. Cause I was wondering about the intrusion, you know, is, could there be some kind of an intrusion related system, which is elevated in copper or, or zinc and those kind of things, but it, it doesn't seem like that. But nope. uh, yeah, Jojana was wondering if there is uh, if there's any of those base metals in the syngenetic sulfides. Yep, yeah, it's a really good question, and she's right. There is zinc associated with uh, with the syngenetic pyrite. Sometimes we, we do cis pyrite uh, that has been remobilized by vein on, on some of the other prospects, not at Patron itself, but usually when when we have like those um, like the photo I showed, uh, those interval of like. Um, Oops, man. More. These ones, they, you, you'll see like zinc going going up like in the high hundreds, if not low thousands of ppm zinc. Uh, so yeah, there is elevated zinc with it. Mm -hmm. And the brown silica, well, the brown silica, it, it's definitely, uh, the, there's silica, there's like, um, there, there's probably leucoxane in it. If, if you uh, zap it with the, um, with the XRF, you you have you always have like high, high titanium content, so uh, I believe there is some some leucoxane associated with it too. Uh, we haven't done really much infection through it, so I, I can't answer in more detail than that. Yeah, so that intrusion it looks like it's you know it really plays a big part of the in the story, right? That that that's where really the zone blows out. So you think it's it's just a really good host rock for it because is. of the rheologic contrast? Exactly. That's what I believe. It's not the first, um, it's not the only one or the first one. You, I mean, Goldex near Val d'Or, similar story. Um, I think there's a there's one of the zone at Sigma, which is also similar. Um, I mean, there's yeah. other example. Um, uh, War is Null in, in, in Guyana is, is similar. Uh, it's just a very, very good, um, good old rock as far as cracking, uh, like um, geochemically, I mean, the, the mafic rocks are, are better uh, for, for, for sulfidation and, and for precipitating gold, but for cracking and, and basically channeling a lot of fluids, the, the, the contrast between the rheology of that intrusive versus the old rock is what allow the the development of such a tick zone yep mm -hmm. yeah and then i was wondering about the the veins so when you looked at the the vein orientation it was a bit of a shotgun pattern i mean there was there's a few major orientations but was there that much deformation afterwards that there's a lot of folding of the veins or is it just kind of a stock work of a lot of different orientations of, of extensional veins or we haven't seen like a uh, vein being folded. Like there is like, uh, since the, if you look here on the, the, the top vein, you can clearly see that, that this vein has been boudinage because it's, it's nice, been yeah. probably re, uh, reworked in the shear zone. You know, it's been placed and then the shear moves again. So it, it got, it got boudinage. And then you can see some, some um, fragment of wall rock in it too. And we see that there's usually pretty high grade. Um, the vein themselves don't seem to be folded. Um, I think the the mineralization is 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 late tec late tectonic. I mean, it's it's syntectonic, but it's late, uh, so there's not that much um, um, deformation of the mineralization itself. It's it seems to be from the data we have, uh, it doesn't seem to have been deformed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. 
Yeah, there's a question from Ed. Uh, slide 12, there's a, there's a large phenocryst. What's, do you know what the composition of that is? Slide 12, 15. Oh, that's slide 12. Is it uh, later? This one? Ed, maybe you can go on uh, unmute. Uh, which, which photo was that? That's that slide that you just had on a couple of slides ago with the big quartz vein going through it. This one? In the channel samples. In the channel samples. Yeah, no? a, big, a big phenocryst. I'm um, not sure what, what they look. The go to, um, I think it's the photo that also has the zinc mosaic or the syngenetic. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. this one? There's a bit of lag in our in the in the slide. Yeah, you see. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. See all those? Uh, they look like phenocris. Or is like that like? Or is that lichen? This one here? No, no. Go back to the previous one. Oh, okay. Oh, that's lichen. So remember when I saw that when I said at the beginning that this is this vein was outcropping. This is basically a discovery, uh, like I said, a discovery outcrop that was known before um, Azimuth took the property. You can see that it was outcropping because of that lichen. So these are all lichen. If it had been stripped, you, you wouldn't see any lichen anymore, but that was actually outcropping, which is kind of like the northwest, uh, northwestern end of the, of the outcrop. So that vein here at the bottom is right here. And, and most of all of this was uh, was not outcropping. There was a bit of outcrop, I, I believe, around in this area too. And then by by Bailey stripping with a shovel, they found uh, this this high grade area, and that Bailey started the um, the thing over here in front. It's all swamp, and in the back here, it's actually outcrop. But you're getting into the gabbro, which is mostly unmineralized. There's a bit of mineralization in it, but not much. Yeah. Simon, do you see any traces of arsenic in and, and arsenopyrite? Arsenic? No, there's no arsenopyrite. Arsenic is uh, it's not there, except for I think there's one hole uh, where there's a bit of elevated arsenic. I think it's five ppm, as I did with the with the with the gold with the gold. So it's nothing. Most of it doesn't like it's not even almost not detectable. And there's one instance where the zone has about close to 5 ppm arsenic. So it's not a pathfinder for, for, for dismineralization. Like the, the, the hydrothermal system is gold, silver, tellurium, uh, lead, and possibly, um, possibly um, bismuth and tungsten, but that could be associated with the intrusive as well. There's no copper, there's no, um, no zinc, no, this is basically the only out of like our 60, um, 63 element suite, that's the only one that have any kind of correlation with, with the gold. Yeah. Are, are you cutting any of your assays? For uh, for reporting at this point, no. Um, Azimuth has not, has not been cutting any of their assays. I think the yeah. highest grade assay is about 160. I think it's maybe one at 190 as well, but mostly, their exception, um, like when we have high grade, usually it's like 10 to 20 grams um, and, and usually consistent. There'll have to be some studies done to, uh, to see what is the capping that we'll need to, um, to use for the resource. That's all in progress. There's a question here uh, by Marcus, just explaining the high grade capping of, uh, or cutting of assays. So. Maybe you can explain, Simone, but it's, it's yeah, if it's the gold mineralization is nuggety, you get some outliers that are really high grade. Yep. So you, you want to cut that back so it doesn't skew the, the average, right? Yep. Yes, it's usually like you, you, you by studying a deposit and distribution of, of, of grade, you'll, um, you'll figure out like a maximum uh, allowed gold grade, let's say, and anything above that will be capped to that number. So, so Let's say you, you you do the exercise and you see, well, anything above, uh, I don't know, 50 grams per ton 
is, is, very, is due to the nugget effect and it's not representative of, of uh, the intercept and mineralization. So you'll, you'll basically yeah. bring it down back to 50 grams to uh, compensate for that. Yeah, you usually use that at the resource estimation stage. Yep. Of course, we also have a consultant here in the audience, so I don't want to I don't want to say anything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry? No, we have a consultant also in the audience, so I don't want to okay. say anything stupid. But um, <laughs> if you go back to the drawing of the veins and shears, um, Jared had a question here about the relationship of the felsic intrusive and, and the orientation of the, yep. the veins and the shears. Maybe he can also go on unmute so he can explain the question a little bit better. Yeah, this is a beautiful map, by the way. This really well yeah, that, was, uh, that was done by, oh, I forgot his name. Uh, the lithology was basically mapped by um, a student, Baptiste, uh, I forgot his last name, but he he did his like, um, uh, like study wrap up, like uh, end of study project was uh, on, um, on, on this mechanical stripping. And then basically we, we finished by mapping like all, all the veins to get a better idea of like a vein distribution and, and all that stuff. So the the area which are like red with the, this, this is basically the area of like very high stock work of, of veins. Uh, mm -hmm. Just too many veins to map them independently, you know? Yeah, but you, yeah, you kind of see two, two dominant orientations that you were mentioning the Northwest, Southeast vein, vein trends and then the one that's almost East West. Yep. Something like, like basically that. the shear vein and like those uh, those extension veins associated with the dextral transgressive movement. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we also have like this one here, which seems like a big vein. This is the only flat vein that 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 we saw on, on the outcrop, but, but they're there. This vein is um, is dipping about thirty degrees towards the uh, the southeast. So that's our yeah. other orientation that. It's also present on the outcrop. Now, based on this map, like it doesn't look like most of the veins are inside the the main felsic intrusion. It looks like they're more in this area where there's a lot of felsic dikes. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, the photo of the photo is is on of this dike here, which is uh, it, it's a felsic intrusive. Um, but that's that's where the photo that that you saw of like uh, all the veins you haven't mapped. All, all of them, but it's about like 25 to 30% uh, vein density in, in this area. Uh, yeah. The edge of that intrusive here is um, also really, really uh, got a lot of vein. Um, in the drilling, we always um, see that association though. Maybe on the outcrop is not as clear, but uh, once we drill, we usually get into the better part of, of the deposit when we have um, an intrusive associated with it. it. It won't necessarily be all in the intrusive. It might be just on the edge of it, you know? Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's, it's mostly because of that contrast of rheology. Yeah, and there's probably a lot of clasps of the whole struck exactly. inside the intrusion. So you don't always see that it's, it's, you're still in the intrusion, but there's a lot of these big rafts sitting yep. in. Yeah. You see that at the, at the outcrop too. Uh, if you have a chance at one point, you'll see that in, 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 in those dikes, you can see a fragment of the basalt and fragment of the felsic uh, volcanics as well. Yeah. Now, could you maybe go to the mag map, which was actually really beautiful too. I think, is that a drone mag? Uh, like a really high resolution yeah. drone mag probably? That was done, uh, no, that was, uh, that was a aerial mag. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, it seems very, very detailed, but yeah. Um, it's 25 meters over like Patois over this area and I think 50 meters on the eastern part. So is there this big mag low here, is there like a major structure there? Is there, is there a main regional shear zone or, or you know, we would call them breaks in, in the southern TV? This mag low here you're talking about? Or? Yeah. Well, yeah, like that big mag low that goes from north east to southwest. Yeah. I, th I think it's mostly related to uh, to different rock over here. Uh, there's there's a sedimentary sequence uh, that that goes through. Like that very high mag that you see just south of the mag low is actually an iron formation. So, um, so from from the outcropping areas, uh, some of it is actually a sedimentary sequence. Um, 
for, from what we can tell, a lot of this of these areas are actually though like difficult to access. They're they're under swamps and stuff like that. So there's not that many yeah. outcrop. The iron formation outcrops really well and it's fairly uh, sedimentary. Yeah, so I was wondering, you know, it's a pretty long strike length. You've got 35 kilometers of uh, what are some of your exploration me methods to try to focus in and prioritize some of the target areas? Yeah, well, at first there was like a basic an area of like about eight by three kilometers, which corresponded to uh, the majority of the historic occurrences. And also that basically uh, mag pattern that we basically understood quite fast that corresponded to our green cheese species window. Um, so, so that area was prioritized. There was a till that was run and we did an IP survey as well, covering this whole area. Um, the, the IP um, gave a lot of anomalies as it usually does. <laughs> uh, the thing is there's a lot of false positives because we have, we have like, um, yeah, some, the, the Gavro has some magnetite in it sometimes, which gives you um, uh, IP response. We also have some sedimentary rock quite rich in magnetite, which are kind of almost iron formation, but not quite, uh, which gives you also um, a high response in, 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 in IP. Uh, and the other thing is I think the IP didn't see anything underneath the swamp because if you overlay basically, the map of of the resistivity or or the chargeability on top of the outcrop map, you see that like all the all the IP anomalies and all the uh, resistive anom uh, areas are where there's outcrop, and when there's swamp, there's basically you can see even the formational IP uh, chargeability anomaly that probably follows these these magnetite rich sedimentary rock. They basically end where the swamp starts, mm -hmm. which doesn't make sense. And it starts again on the other side of the swamp. So yeah. I believe that didn't see through um, the swampy area. And that is why we are doing this here, the RC program to get a geochemical, like a, a fast way to get geochemical coverage over this, this, this swamp area. And if you look like Northeast of um, Patois, uh, there's a, like the next two kilometers of strike length along that shear, which is the, the first place you're gonna go look is if you have like a fertile shear, continue looking along that shear, you can look at great bear, see the success they've had and all that stuff. That next two to two and a half kilometers is completely covered by swamps. So in order to explore that, I mean, you could always go stick some holes in them, but we, we decided to go with RC first to get a, a geochemical footprint. We're confident that with the, um, with our pathfinder, we can define uh, uh, anomalous area and then go back and, and do it with core. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, good. Well, thanks a lot. I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Yeah, uh, I had one here. Oh, Frank. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the the um, when you when you when you have the, the old crop stripped, it's it's kind of easy to see the jolly. But if it, from a prospecting point of view, if if it was all covered, could you could you, is there something that would indicate you might be in a perspective area of interest by either looking at the shear zones compared to, or the shear veins compared to the extensional veins or something else? Is there something that would give you, um, you know, tweak you, tell you to slow down and, and sample and, and take some in prospect more de in detail? Yeah, I, I think anytime you, you see a vein that returns 10 grams per ton, you need to... <laughs> you need yeah, to if you don't know that, you don't, if, if you if don't know that at the vein time. Or if it's a system. Um, it, it's very difficult because, I mean, you can prospect in this area, you can find vein, they'll have high grade, but it's just a small vein and it's not continuous and you, and you won't find anything else. But in, in, in this particular case, I mean, you just have to rem to do the work, remove the moss, and see that it's not only one vein, but it's a vein system, and, and uh, that it's like mineralization is throughout the vein system. Um, if it, if it if you lucky enough for it to be outcropping, if it's not outcropping, um, till can help you. Over there, most of the till has been washed. The till, um, the thickness of the till is very very thin, um, so we we've had to take like very big area of till and it seems to be mostly in place, but there's 
high tier anomaly, I think up to 80 grains of gold on top of the deposit, uh, the highest tier sample is, is sitting right on top of it. Um, so tail could help you. Um, there is a good IP response over the deposit because it's yeah. it's kind of outcropping uh, and you can clearly differentiate the IP response from the deposit to the IP response of the gambrose out of it, which also has a response because of the magnetite. Um, so it's higher and you see it, 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 it just goes the distance of the deposit. So it's pretty clear that, that it, it detects it. Uh, the problem is that it didn't seem to see underneath the covered area to the swampy area. Would be good if that diorite uh, would light up in, as a mag mag feature that you know you could find other diorites because I mean it seems to be a good host rock. Yeah, it doesn't seem to to um, to light up. I mean, I don't have a mag that's close light. There is a, actually like a mag eye that corresponds that gives you a bullseye on the deposit, but it, it mostly corresponds to uh, this uh, mafic rock, which, which kind of sub, it's suggestive that there is a fold here. This is pre mineralization, of course, and and, and there is like basically a mag eye corresponding to that um, thickening in in the basalt here. Um, okay. yeah. I don't have a map of, of this specific area, but yeah, so, so there is one, but it, it doesn't follow um, all the intrusive. It's basically. And you can, we do like a systematic um, magnetic susceptibility uh, measurement on both our prospection sample and also our downhole uh, uh, rock. And you can clearly see that the, the magnetic rocks are, are the, the mafic rocks, either the gabbro or the, the fine grain basalts or some volcanic intrusive here. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's no... Uh... No more questions. Yeah, we you know wish you all the best for the for the field season. You, you do have a drill turning, a couple of drills turning right now, or yeah, there's two drills turning at the moment, uh, yeah. and I think there's going to be shortly a, a third one. And also the RC rig is probably moving as we speak, or if it's not, uh, yeah. it'll be pretty pretty fast. Yeah, well, I wish you all the best, and yeah, we'll we'll get you back uh, maybe when the maiden resource estimate comes out, or maybe. In the third year, when you when you when you do get the discovery of the year award, when the resource estimate comes out, then we'll, we'll get you back. Uh, give us an update. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we'll be fighting fighting you for that one the next year again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Well, okay. Well, all the best, much, Attila, and, and please make sure to include me uh, in uh, when you send out um, um, and invites for these things. Uh, I think it's a very good format. I really enjoyed the discussion we had before the talk too. I think that's a great idea. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll definitely join in. Yeah, perfect. Well, thanks again. Thanks for all the audience and uh, and uh, have a good night. See you, see you in a month. Take care, bye. Yeah. Bye.